On the 15th of September, the British Medical Association, a prestigious scientific institution consisting of over 159,000 doctors and 19,000 medical students, held its annual conference, during which the Northwest Regional Council forwarded a motion that stated the following, quote, that this meeting affirms the rights of transgender and non-binary individuals to access health care and live their lives with dignity, including having their identity respected, and calls upon the government to 1. Allow transgender and non-binary individuals to gain legal recognition of their gender by witness sworn statement. 2. Ensure that under-18s are able to access health care in line with existing principles of consent established by UK case law and guidelines published by public bodies which set these standards for health care. 3. Enable trans people to receive health care in settings appropriate to their gender identity. 4. Ensure trans healthcare workers are able to access facilities appropriate to the gender they identify as. And 5. Ensure trans people are able to access gendered spaces in line with the gender they identify as. End quote. After discussion grounded in both the science and ethics relating to the matter, this motion was passed in full and therefore became the official stars of the British Medical Association and all its members. Now, this came at a time where leaks suggested that the UK government was planning to scrap plans to reform the 2004 Gender Recognition Act, something that has, since the passing of the motion, been confirmed by the Sunday Times. What this means is that trans people will require a medical diagnosis, including a two-year wait period, in order to receive a gender recognition certificate, which is required to change a person's birth certificate, marriage certificate, tax documents, and pension. This is in spite of the fact that 64.1% of the general public consulted by the government stated that there should not be a requirement for a diagnosis of gender dysphoria in the future, 78.6% were in favour of removing the requirement for individuals to provide evidence of having lived in their acquired gender for a period of time, two years at current, and 80.3% of respondents were in favour of removing the requirements for a medical report which details all treatment received. The process of self-IDing would still require a legal declaration. It just wouldn't be needlessly medicalized, something that I feel is important to point out since a lot of the discussion surrounding self-ID makes it sound like it's some frivolous decision that can be done on a whim, when it isn't. Similarly, I'd like to note that a gender recognition certificate is not required to legally change official documents such as passports and driver ID, nor is it required to be granted access to spaces in line with a person's declared gender or be protected from discrimination. Access to gender spaces and protection from discrimination are already guaranteed under the 2010 Equalities Act, extending to all trans people, including non-binary folk, as was ruled in court on the 14th of September this year, the day before the MBA motion was passed. So, there's a lot going on in the UK right now in relation to trans rights, something which hasn't gone unnoticed by the lovely people over at the Christian Institute, who conducted a rather alarmist interview with anti-trans pediatrician Dr. Julia Maxwell about the BMA siding with the medical consensus. Yet, before we can begin to address that, I must give a content warning for the following topics. Transphobia, homophobia, ableism, child abuse, suicide, genital mutilation, and medical malpractice. I'd also like to point out that I've gone ahead and added an audio readout of the questions shown on screen in the Christian Institute video for accessibility purposes. So with that noted, let's get down to business. Does it concern you that doctors have moved away from biological fact when considering gender? I would uh, certainly be concerned about the abandoning of the biological definitions of uh, male and female and using uh, non-binary as a um, medical definition. Um, so much of medicine is based on uh, biology and is based on differences between male and female that it raises all kinds of uh, ethical and um, medical questions about treating various illnesses um, and how we should approach uh, our, um, the way we treat patients. Acknowledging the demonstrable facts that the biology of sex is way more complicated than previously understood is not, as the Christian Institute puts it, quote, moving away from biological fact, end quote. 
rather the opposite. It's bringing the public's understanding in line with what the scientific and medical consensus has been for decades. A shift based on the evidence we observe. Because this isn't just a trans issue. Each and every one of us is a blend of sexual traits to some degree. The perfectly sexually dimorphic person being a myth. What's more is an estimated 2% of all people are medically intersex. That's to say these sexual traits are blended to such a degree that it is considered significantly atypical. Now, I personally argue that trans people are a sort of psychologically intersex, meaning that the part of their biological brain that deals with personal sexual perception and all social interaction stemming from that does not align with the rest of their sexual characteristics. Quick note, this does not in any way impact gendered behaviours or interests, such as dress style or career path, any more than a person's sexuality does. That's why trans people have the same range of gender expression as cis people. Yet one thing the science is unanimous on is the fact that it is impossible, and I mean impossible, to actively change a person's gender, and that all attempts to do so are highly destructive and completely unethical due to one's gender being innate and immutable. Returning to the quote, all kinds of ethical and medical questions, end quote, that Maxwell brings up, if acknowledging and supporting the existence of trans people, including non-binary folk, raises ethical and medical questions, then that's a good thing. Why? Because these people exist whether or not Maxwell wants to pull the wool over her eyes. So if accepting that demonstrable fact results in a review of our current system, then that is a review we are in dire need of. The review isn't the problem. It's the solution to the problem of inadequate healthcare for trans and intersex patients. So by presenting these questions as something negative, Maxwell is attacking the rights of both trans and intersex patients to adequate healthcare. The British Medical Association wants people to be able to self-declare their gender. What do you make of that? I think there are lots of problems with uh, self-declaring uh, gender. Um, there are issues around the fact that if, if we um, make it that it's not a medical problem, that raises issues around the fact that currently people who wish to change their gender um, are seeking medical treatment to do that and surgical treatment, which if it's not a medical condition, then you know why does it need medical and surgical um, treatment? It's here that Maxwell makes very clear that she either has little to no understanding of the topic or does and is actively misleading viewers. Here, Maxwell is conflating being transgender and having gender dysphoria. A transgender person is simply someone whose gender differs to the one they were assigned at birth. Meanwhile, gender dysphoria refers to the psychological distress someone can experience if their body doesn't align with their sense of gender or if their gender isn't recognised. Gender dysphoria is a clinical diagnosis, being a medical condition that causes significant distress or disability. Being transgender is not. Indeed, many trans people do not suffer gender dysphoria. What this tells us is that gender dysphoria is not a universal nor essential experience. As laid out very plainly by the American Psychological Association, the largest scientific and professional organization of psychologists in the United States. Now the reason this is important is Maxwell is obscuring things by bringing up medical transitioning when the GRA reform has absolutely nothing to do with it. There are three general types of transitioning, social, legal, and medical. Social refers to things such as your names and pronouns. Legal refers to official documents, such as passports and birth certificates. And lastly, medical refers to things such as hormone replacement therapy, aka HRT, or gender affirmation surgery. A trans person may feel dysphoric along all, some, or none of these lines. Now this is important to know since self-ID is purely a legal issue and is in no way related to a person seeking to medically transition. They may have a medical cause in that their legal documents are dysphoria inducing, yet many do not. Fact is, it's kind of irrelevant since we're not talking about medical intervention, but a legal one. 
In order to medically transition, a person still has to go through medical assessment, something self-ID has zero impact on. Which leads us to the major problem with the current system. The way in which it, as with Maxwell, unnecessarily medicalizes legally transitioning. The current system, as set by the 2004 Gender Recognition Act, forces trans folk to live as their gender for two years, which sounds simple enough. The only problem is, what constitutes living as their gender is highly subjective. Trans people in the UK often find themselves being forced to adhere to outdated gender norms and pressured into medically transitioning by prejudiced GPs as a means of proving their transness. The result of which, besides restricting the expressive freedom of trans people in dictating what is and isn't masculine and feminine, is that it pushes unnecessary medical procedures on those seeking legal recognition, something that is a gross violation of medical ethics. Medical transitioning is a path that should be made available to those suffering gender dysphoria or believe the process will significantly improve their quality of life. It should not be forced on people wanting to change their legal documentation. But that is what Maxwell is defending here. And, rather ironically, she's pretending as if self-ID would cause the very thing it was created to solve. Now, I don't expect your average person to know all this. After all, it's not like we're taught this in school. However, this is the entire basis upon which the calls for reform were made. So for Maxwell to not understand the basics or to actively lie about them, knowing full well that the Christian Institute is interviewing her as an authority on the subject, that is a major problem. The fact is, Maxwell is clearly incapable of discussing the issue in a factual and or ethical manner and should therefore refuse to comment. Of course, she won't do that since this is a propaganda piece meant to fuel the fires of trans hysteria, but that would be the only moral course of action if she had any integrity. Um, I think the other issue is that um, if people can just self-declare um, and they can go and seek medical uh, treatment and say that they are a different uh, gender to their biological gender, um, then then that, that changes the way we treat them, um, or it could change the way we treat them. For example, if they said they were male and they were in fact female, um, they could potentially be pregnant and we wouldn't, wouldn't know that. It is frankly shocking to come into contact with a paediatrician who doesn't know what a patient file is. If a patient is transgender, their file should note that, as well as detailing if and how they've medically transitioned. What's more is trans people, especially those who have medically transitioned, are very diligent when it comes to their healthcare, sometimes even catching things that their doctors have missed or failed to consider in light of their transition. We are not afforded the luxury of being lax in a world which is still unsupportive of our existence. And if, in the rare exception, you find yourself still unsure, be a grown-up and ask. It really isn't that difficult, so to see Maxwell pretend otherwise, it's really telling. What's more is, you should already be questioning your assumptions about patients. Not only do trans people exist, but, as already noted, 2% of all people are medically intersex. Seeing as some parts of the UK have as many as 2,900 patients per practicing GP, that is a considerable number of people each doctor will see that has an atypical physiology. And that's only considering sexual physiology. There are countless other conditions which result in atypical physiology. If you fail to acknowledge this fact and change your behavior accordingly, then you are failing your patients. On top of this, What's really important to note about the British Medical Association's official announcement that the motion had passed is that it included the following statement. Quote, the BMA is also calling for increased trans awareness to become an integral part of medical training in order to ensure an awareness of the needs of these patients. End quote. 
it's almost as if those actually informed on the subject are taking steps to ensure trans folk receive the best quality care available. And your little display here isn't actually out of care for us, but instead a hollow excuse intent on denying us our humanity. Um, and there's also the big issue of um, children and young people being able to self-declare their gender as well, which brings a whole raft of other issues. Currently, a person has to be of 18 years of age in order to receive their gender recognition certificate, and there is no evidence that this age would be lowered for self-ID. Indeed, the Republic of Ireland, which has allowed for self-ID since 2015, requires a person to be 18 years of age in order to do so, though there are exceptions made for over 16s who secure a court order. So for you to cry about children being able to self-ID, that's a problem you've invented. However, there's still the question of what issues Maxwell is referring to. Even if we allow children to legally transition, changing just their birth certificate since I don't imagine many children work, are married, or have a pension, what problems would that cause outside of the usual cost in setting up a new system? Well, Maxwell fails to explain her fears, which would be a problem on its own in that her claims are completely void of any basis, and yet, we can't ignore the social context and how people such as Maxwell have spent years drip-feeding the public fears about the trans community, culminating in the current trans hysteria. This is important since what Maxwell is doing here is effectively writing a blank check for transphobia, allowing the viewers to fill in whichever prejudice motivates them in their dislike for trans people. Another thing my editor Levi pointed out is that it effectively makes her position undebunkable. There's no testable merit to what she says here. So the people whose fears are validated by this vague insinuation can't have those fears challenged. All we can do is point to where the system works, yet they'll always retreat to the possibility that we haven't considered something. In effect, this is a sort of transphobia of the gaps argument. Sadly, it seems effective. Is the two-year waiting period appropriate if you want to get a gender recognition certificate? I think the um, period at the moment of waiting uh, before you can get a gender recognition certificate is, is actually really important. Um, people who are seeking a gender recognition certificate are often people who have other concurrent mental health problems uh, and um, they need time to decide whether actually this is something that they uh, do wish to do long term. Um, some people do find that living uh, as the opposite sex is something that they uh, do find helps them in the long term. However, there are also many people who realise after a period of time that um, actually living as the opposite sex doesn't uh, solve all of the issues that they had and that actually they prefer then to return to living as their biological sex. Note the way Maxwell downplays the number of people satisfied with transitioning as some, whilst exaggerating the number of people dissatisfied as many, in spite of all evidence showing us the exact opposite. I get the strong feeling that Maxwell is attempting to blur the lines between medical and legal transitioning. I have never heard desistance brought up in relation to legal transition, as it's something that's very easy to resolve. Go to your court, explain how you reached a premature conclusion, and get a court order that allows you to change your birth certificate back. Whilst I imagine doing this repeatedly would result in issues, I don't see this as being an issue if done once, not unless we decide to make it one. So in light of this, Maxwell's point here is largely stolen from the deconversion myth, sometimes referred to as sex change regret. This is in spite of the fact that the vast majority of people who medically transition are happy with their choice. When we look at the vast number of studies on the effectiveness of medical transition, whilst the satisfaction in the 60s was as high as 27%, these numbers have plummeted to anywhere between 2 and 0.3% by the first decade of the new millennium. What's important to note is that this regret is mostly intermittent and is typically the result of secondary factors, such as enduring or increased social hostility, or dissatisfaction with surgical methods. 
Yet in spite all of that, almost all prefer to continue to live as their chosen gender. Lastly, we need to address the ableism Maxwell displays here. Mental illness doesn't erase a person's humanity, nor does it erase their needs. As Levi so succinctly put it, quote, anything a non-mentally ill person can be is something a mentally ill person can be, end quote. Someone can have a mental illness, even one which severely impairs their judgment and perception, while still being transgender. Now, we do not deny people necessary care on grounds that they have recurrent mental health conditions, especially when those recurrent mental health conditions can be caused through a denial of that very care. Therefore, what Maxwell has argued here is on par with arguing that a diabetic should be denied insulin on grounds that they have a chronic illness. Now, I get what Maxwell is attempting to imply here, that mental health conditions will make people wrongly think they're trans and therefore they'll go on to transition, only to discover that wasn't the solution? Sally for Maxwell, she has no evidence to support this. What's more is that self-ID is a legal process, making it subject to the same protections and safeguards as similar processes. For example, said statutory declaration has to be signed in the presence of a witness, effectively having a second person sign off on someone's ability to make that decision. Of course, there's always the possibility of the system failing, as with every system, but this is something that could be considered if a person appeared before the court about having made a premature decision, like mentioned earlier. But it gets worse, since not only is Maxwell arguing trans people with mental health conditions should be denied self-ID, She's attacking self-ID for everyone on the grounds that some trans people have mental health problems. Note that this standard is very selectively applied only to trans people, in spite of the fact that one in four people will suffer a mental health disorder at some point in their life according to the World Health Organization. Nowhere has Maxwell issued a call to limit the rights of cis people by her own standard. Maxwell doesn't see mental health issues as a genuine concern, she sees them as a weapon to be wielded against trans people. This whole section is frankly disgusting, and should result in an immediate review of Maxwell's professional license. So I think there's also a big issue amongst um, children and adolescents. Uh, adolescence goes up until the age of 25, as we're very much realising, Um, And during that time, as we know, um, young people change their minds about what they want for the future, about how they view things, um, and to be able to make decisions about their gender, which may have long-term repercussions, um, is something that needs to to be done over time, and they need to be given time to uh, explore that fully. As a paediatrician, what concerns you most about the BMA's move? I'm particularly worried about the um the 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 clause which is talking about under 18 so as as a pediatrician that's what particularly bothers me um children uh are going through a period of growth and change um up to the age of 18 many of them are still going through puberty um or have only just gone through puberty um and to be making decisions about uh their gender identity um at a time when uh trying to find their identity is is part of what what they're doing as they grow up um, is really dangerous. I left those two sections together as they cover the same ground. The section Maxwell was referring to here is the part of the motion that declared the British government must, quote, ensure that under 18s are able to access healthcare in line with existing principles of consent established by UK case law and guidelines published by the public bodies which set the standards for healthcare. End quote. Pay special attention to, in line with existing principles, as in the pre existing standards used to guide best practice for cis people, the same standards that set the age of medical consent at 16 years. We see that Maxwell is attempting to argue the case for trans people being second class citizens in the same way that gay and bisexual people were when it came to the age of consent. For those who don't know, 
Even after same-gender attraction was legalized in 1967, the age of sexual consent for same-gender intercourse was 21 years of age, compared to 16. It was subsequently lowered to 18 years of age in 1994, before finally being equalized in 2001. She's not out there campaigning to raise the age of medical consent for cis people, she's only bothered when the same rights can be used by trans people to improve their own quality of life. As for legal recognition, if Maxwell is really so terrified that someone under the age of 25 will make the wrong decision, the solution is simple. Allow under 25s to change the gender marker on their birth certificate as many times as necessary as they explore who they are. Or offer them the choice to put undecided or a similar option there until they do reach a conclusion. Now you might say that this would create a lot of work for people. Well, perhaps we should just remove gender markers from marriage certificates, taxes and pensions. That way, all that needs to be updated is the birth certificate, which, if everything is digitized, should be as easy as changing a single letter on a document. Um, and when you're talking about even younger children, um, that's even more of a concern because uh, often that may well be adults around them uh, raising those issues um, rather than the child themselves who really is not capable of making those kind of decisions. Um, we, we do talk about Gillick competence and children being competent to consent for themselves, but actually in this particular situation, I, I don't see how an, an under 18 year old can um, actually consent to living as the opposite sex when they have no real understanding of, of what that means and what that might mean for the future if they were to go through full uh, gender reassignment um, that they, you know, they they find it difficult to see past the next year or, or two years let alone uh, the rest of their lives. What don't you get about in line with existing principles of consent established by UK case law and guidelines published by the public bodies which set the standards for healthcare? You're supposed to be a bloody healthcare professional. Now I notice that Maxwell never actually states the specific point of the motion she's referring to, and the Christian Institute sure as hell never displays or links it. Again, all seemingly done so Maxwell can assert whatever she wants about the motion without actually addressing what it says. The BMA call for trans healthcare to be brought in line with all other healthcare. That's all point two of the motion states. So any argument Maxwell makes here as to why trans people shouldn't be able to consent is an argument that can be made in regards to everyone else. But she won't do that since she's not concerned with being consistent. She's only concerned with hurting trans people. Now, one of the things Maxwell falls back on, even if she doesn't mention it by name, is a sort of Munchausen by proxy in relation to trans children. The unsubstantiated belief that parents are coercing their children into being transgender. Indeed, the only thing bigots have to turn to are grossly warped anecdotes, such as those relating to Luna Damon Younger. For over a year now, far-right voices have clung to her case as liberal mum forces son to be transgender, largely on the testimony of Luna's father. However, once we investigate the case, the truth of what transpired becomes very apparent. Not only is Luna's mother a trained paediatrician, but when the father objected to the first paediatrician who diagnosed Luna on grounds that they and the mother worked at the same office, the mother scheduled a second paediatrician she had no prior contact with, only to have that paediatrician reach the same conclusion as the first. Whilst Luna's father claims to allow his daughter to dress and present however she wants at home, claiming she chooses to present as a boy when the mother isn't around and sharing photographs of her to strangers online as evidence of this, under court oath, his story does a 180. Suddenly, he acknowledges that no, he refuses to allow Luna to wear girls' clothes, banning them from the house. What's more is that whilst Luna's father claims she wanted to have a haircut when talking to the public, under oath he admitted to having assaulted his daughter, 
forcing her to have her hair cut short, violating the original court order set by the judge. I should also note that an independent social worker assigned to the family by the court has interviewed Luna without either of her parents being present and assessed her well-being, only to inform the court that Luna is genuinely afraid of her father due to his abusive behaviour, particularly in relation to social events such as parent-teacher meetings and soccer matches. Parents do not force their children to be trans. They abuse them into hiding in the closet. When Maxwell insinuates that trans children are the victims of Munchausen by proxy, she's not just denying reality, she is enabling child abuse. And whilst we have no such examples of what Maxwell forwards, what we do have are failed experiments carried out in the 60s and 70s by John Money, a psychologist who set out to prove that gender was socially taught rather than innate and immutable, and that children could be convinced to live and identify as a different gender. To do this, he reassigned a male infant, David Reamer, whose phallus was destroyed during circumcision, getting the parents to raise the boy as a girl whilst using David's twin brother as a control. Yet instead of proving that gender could be taught socially, all money managed to do was give David gender dysphoria as he grew up to identify as a man. This is in spite of the fact that David was a naive participant. He had no idea he was reassigned as an infant. His father only told him when he turned 15, years after he had already begun to show signs of suicidal ideation. Sadly, the damage money had done to David and his family was so significant that it prevented him from forming familial bonds. David died by suicide on the 4th of May, 2004. This forever refuted the assertion that a cis child could be convinced by anyone to live as the opposite gender. The entire medical establishment, with the support of David's parents, failed to do what Maxwell is pretending untrained parents are capable of doing. Thing is, whilst Money's hypothesis would have contradicted the established trans understanding of gender as innate and immutable, we weren't the target. Money's experiments were carried out as an attempt to scientifically justify the genital mutilation of intersex children. The problem was, whilst Money's experiment was a complete failure, he fabricated favourable reports that pretended otherwise, claiming that David had been successfully reassigned with no adverse effects. Only now, as more people are becoming aware of intersex rights, are the institutions that money helped hold in place finally being brought into question. Yet people such as Maxwell have played no part in said movement. In fact, many support the unethical medical procedures done on intersex patients in a desire to normalise them. All whilst pretending to be concerned about trans teens making informed decisions guided by trained professionals. It's one of the great hypocrisies seen in the trans hysteria. So with that myth dispelled, what exactly happens to young people who are thought to be transgender? Well, the first thing that happens is they're referred to a gender identity clinic for assessment. These clinics take the gender affirmative approach, supporting and nurturing a child in their gender exploration. However, the vast majority, 84.2%, receive no further support. I should note that in spite of the study being titled Desisting and Persisting Gender Dysphoria After Childhood, a qualitative follow-up study, there was no clinical diagnosis of gender dysphoria involved or indeed any initial assessment. Instead, the study qualified gender dysphoria by the child's referral to gender identity clinics by untrained adults. This key fact has been used to mislead the public into thinking gender dysphoria, the clinical diagnosis, desists in the vast majority of trans youth when it doesn't. However, this raises the question, why do so many desist? Well, it's because the professionals at these gender identity clinics that take the child-led gender affirmative approach are incredibly efficient at figuring out which child likely is and is not transgender, using key differences between the two groups to ensure that nobody receives any unnecessary treatment. 
Yet out of those who move on to puberty blockers, 100% go on to medically transition via HRT. Because the system works. Assessment during gender affirmation filters out non-trans children before medical transition even enters the equation. Now it's here that we should discuss puberty blockers, seeing as there's a lot of confusion about what they do. They were even brought up during the debate surrounding the BMA's motion, yet offered no justifiable reason for concern. Puberty blockers are a set of medications that put puberty on pause. They were originally developed for children who go through precocious, also known as early onset, puberty, and have been the go-to treatment for said condition the past three decades. More recently, doctors realised they could use the same medication to delay puberty in trans youth, giving them an additional two to four years to work alongside medical professionals to figure out the best path for them. When the blockers are removed, puberty continues as normal, whether brought about by the body's own hormones or by the hormones introduced to the body by HRT. So to recap, these are medications that have been used on children for over 30 years, they're fully reversible, and have no known prolonged side effects. This is why the concern raised at the BMA was likely overruled. Nobody is out there protesting against the usage of puberty blockers for children suffering from precocious puberty. They only become interested when fears about unknown side effects can be used to target children suffering from gender dysphoria. Now, puberty blockers are prescribed during tanner stages 2 and 3, typically to children who are 12 years or older, though there are of course some medical exceptions due to the variable nature of puberty. They'll stay on said medications for up to 2-4 to four years, and once they reach 16 years of age, teens who have been on puberty blockers for at least a year will usually be offered the choice to change their medications over to HRT, at which point we're at the UK standardised age for medical consent. Fact is, whilst there are no known substantial negative side effects to puberty blockers, there are measurable benefits, such as those described in a 2017 paper found in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, which stated, quote, Pubertal suppression is fully reversible, enabling full pubertal development in the natal gender after cessation of treatment, if appropriate. The experience of full endogenous puberty is an undesirable condition for the GD slash gender incongruent individual and may seriously interfere with healthy psychological functioning and well-being. Treating GD slash gender incongruent adolescents entering puberty with GnRH analogues has been shown to improve psychological functioning in several domains. End quote. Likewise, during a 2018 review designed to help the American Academy of Pediatrics set a standardized standard of care titled Ensuring Comprehensive Care and Support for Transgender and Gender Diverse Children and Adolescents, they found the following, quote, Often, pubertal suppression creates an opportunity to reduce the stress that may occur with the development of secondary sexual characteristics and allow for gender-affirming care including mental health support for the adolescent and the family. It reduces the need for later surgery because physical changes that are otherwise irreversible, protrusion of the Adam's apple, male pattern boldness, voice change, breast growth, etc. are prevented. The available data reveal that pubertal suppression in children who identify as transgender generally leads to improved psychological functioning in adolescence and young adulthood. End quote. However, the benefits are not merely short term, as a 2020 paper investigating the relation between puberty suppressants and suicidal ideation discovered, stating that, quote, after adjustment for demographic variables and level of family support for gender identity, those who receive treatment with pubertal suppression, when compared with those who wanted pubertal suppression but did not receive it, had lower odds of lifetime suicidal ideation, end quote. Note that this was not comparing supportive households to unsupportive ones. This was a matched sample comparing supportive households with access to puberty blockers to supportive households which lacked it. And it found that in spite of having a supportive household, being denied puberty blockers resulted in a significant increase 
in lifetime suicidal ideation. The consensus is clear. These are necessary medications for trans and questioning youth. No amount of speculative harm surrounding the side effects of medications that have been used for over three decades can outweigh the observed harm that denying trans youth causes. This is likely why the BMA passed the motion in full, including the section discussing medical access for under-18s, in spite of fearful protest, because the science is entirely one-sided, with malicious speculation being the territory of people such as Dr. Julie Maxwell. Not once did Maxwell supply an actual issue that stood up to scrutiny. Outside of ominous fear-mongering, the only testable concerns she forwarded were about a doctor failing to read their patient's medical file and the lie that parents want to trans children so badly that they're forcing them to transition, in spite of all evidence pointing to the contrary. As speakers at the BMA noted, what we are seeing here is no different than the moral panic surrounding gay and bisexual people 30 years ago. Now, if you appreciate what we do here on the channel, do know that you can support us via Patreon. We no longer monetize our videos, meaning that Patreon is the sole source of income for the channel, allowing us to keep it running. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following patrons. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Soraya and Katie, Garrett Van Voorst, Wellington Marcus, Sosh Daniels, and Justin Allen. And for myself, Adita and Levi, take care now.